Uh, welcome to this webinar from the British Institute of Ankara. I'm David Logan, I'm the Vice President, uh, and I, like so many of you, I'm sure looking forward to a really good conversation with some real, real experts on this very interesting. Um, I wanted to say to start with that video and the audio are both being recorded um, live and live streamed on, on uh, YouTube, and of course, anyone can see it afterwards if they've missed the actual event. Um, on the system, audio, video, and audio, video and audio is off. Audio, video, and audio is off by default. So you can only see the, the panelists uh, and their presentations. As you all know, there's a Q and A button at the bottom. Um, please use that for questions, and we welcome the questions warmly, rather than the chat box. Um, then the questions can be read out by, by me during after. Um, when you ask questions, it's really nice if you could introduce yourselves and your locations um, uh, via the chat feature. Uh, and please um, select the button that says all panelists uh, and attendees for your message to everyone. Um, uh, and um, of course, as you probably know, the BIA does lots of other things besides this. So uh, please uh, uh, join us, become members. Uh, and you will see lots more of interesting stuff to deal with. Thanks very much. Um, so at this stage, I'm going to introduce our first speaker, who is uh, Unal Chevikers. Unal is a distinguished retired diplomat. He was ambassador to London, amongst other places, um, amongst other important countries. Uh, he's currently a member of parliament for Istanbul, and he is deputy chair of the People's Republican Party, the, the major opposition party. Uh, over to you. Thank you, David. Let me also greet all the speakers and the participants who are following this webinar. We are going to discuss the Turkey UK USA relations in the Biden presidency, and we aim to address that very challenging question, such as what can we expect? There are many important developments and changes in the international relations, and this trilateral relationship that we, can, we plan to talk about is also affected by those changes. Well, first of all, it is true that there is a new administration in the USA and there is a general understanding that this new administration is going to be different, to put it in the mildest way, than the Trump administration. Uh, one of the basic differences will be, as it is frequently being mentioned by President Biden himself and members of his administration, is the reinstitutionalization of American foreign policy conduct. Now, this is rather discomforting for President Erdogan because he got very much used to talking to President Trump on the phone and arranging many foreign policy issues, even without having any consultation with the foreign office at all. Same approach was also happening on the US side. Well, apparently this will not be the case under the Biden administration anymore. In fact, it has been already three months after President Biden took office and the two leaders have not yet had any contact at all. This is quite awkward and many draw the conclusion that under the Biden administration, Turkish-US relations will go through the normal institutional channels, namely through the relations between the foreign ministries, ministries of defense and so on. Secondly, among the many parameters that have changed which affect the trilateral relationship we are discussing here, a very significant one is Brexit. This development has a very direct and overwhelming bearing on the future of Turkey-UK relations. And the new setting has many peculiarities and the new conditions may also have a significant impact on the foreign policy of Turkey, of the UK, and also on their relationship with the United States. I have five observations here to submit to your attention to kick off this discussion. One, Brexit, first and foremost, uh, has a direct influence on the future of Turkey's relations with the European Union. Now, why do I emphasize this? I remember my farewell reception in London after four years of my tenure as the Turkish ambassador there. It was on the 24th of June, 2014. In September that year, the Scottish referendum was going to take place. And then in spring 2015, the UK would have general elections. Prime Minister David Cameron had already made it clear that the elections, UK was going to go to a referendum. After the elections, the UK was going to go to a referendum to decide on the future of UK-EU relations. At that time, uh, many believed that Brexit would not happen. And frankly speaking, so did I. Nevertheless, I expressed my proportion and said, dear British friends, don't leave the EU before we get in. And it was quite justified in the sense that the United Kingdom had always been a major supporter of Turkey's bid for EU membership. Today, 
after Brexit, Turkey has now lost a very important supporter for its long-standing target of accession to the EU. Brexit has increased the strength of the other camp. I'm inclined to name this other camp as the continental conspirators. And there is how much, there is now a much stronger tendency to diverge Turkey's ultimate aim from membership and to replace it with an alternative form of relationship. Today, Turkey's relations with the EU is transferred into a transactional relationship. There is no more any hope of uh, light for relaunching the accession negotiations in the short to midterm, mainly because of Turkey's distance uh, from the Copenhagen criteria. The UK is no longer in the EU, even to develop some counter arguments to defend Turkey, although I wonder how effective they would be under current circumstances anyway. But in short, Turkey is handicapped without the UK's presence in the EU in its relations with the Union. Now, this is the bad news. The good news is, and this is my second observation, although Brexit happened, Turkey and the UK have a brand new free trade agreement. Negotiations between the two sides were very intensive and it started as early as 2017 after the Brexit referendum. Both sides were very eager to finalize the FTA as early as possible and they successfully achieved this target just before Brexit happened at the end of last year. Turkey has already ratified the free trade agreement in January this year and we are now expecting the UK side to finalize its own ratification process. Why is the FTA between the UK and Turkey important? Well, first of all, I think the, it will keep the trade and commerce, as well as many aspects of economic contacts, uninterrupted and also in a mutually beneficial manner. There was a lot of concern on both sides whether it would be possible to finalize that agreement in a rather flawless fashion without having a negative impact on our existing bilateral economic, commercial and trade relations, because on the one hand, the UK was still negotiating the Brexit conditions with the EU and Turkey was willing to reform the existing customs union it had with the EU. Well, they did, and I think it is an overwhelming achievement. Nevertheless, I have to express my precaution. This free trade agreement is going to be a living document. Why do I say so? Because even though Brexit has happened, there are so many issues which still need to be regularized, adapted, and redefined in UK's relations with the European Union in the post-Brexit era. Equally, Turkey is also looking forward to the beginning of a reformation process in its customs union with the European Union. Both these processes will require appropriate readjustments in time, and that's the reason why I would consider the continuation of Turkish-UK relations in the post-Brexit era in a handle-with-care state of affairs. Turkey-UK bilateral trade relations in the post-Brexit era are important, and these relations will also open a new horizon for the two countries to look for opportunities of joint ventures and cooperation in third countries too. Of course, it will be a great responsibility on the shoulders of the UK government to, to address the issue of democratic deficit in Turkey and how to tackle with it vis-a-vis -vis the sensitivity that might emerge in the public opinion as well as in the British Parliament. My first two observations were rather explanatory. The other three are mostly related to foreign policy as you would expect from a retired diplomat. And I would prefer to be more exploratory in that realm or let us say more thought-provoking. So my third observation is both Turkey and the UK are now non-EU member NATO countries. This is an important fact, and I think it requires further and perhaps intensified contacts in the field of foreign and security policy between the two countries. Turkish Defense Minister Hulusi Akar paid a visit to the UK last week. I do not have detailed information about the results of the visit, but it demonstrates the importance that both countries attribute to a careful, coordinated cooperation in defense policies. It's also a fact that Turkish-UK cooperation in defense industry has a lot of unexplored opportunities. Why is UK's and Turkey's non-EU NATO member status important? Well, I think firstly because Biden administration is quite determined to restore and strengthen the transatlantic relations uh, between the US and Europe. Relations between NATO and the EU have always been to the disadvantage of non-EU NATO members, and Turkey particularly has complained about this with regard to the Berlin Trust arrangements uh, in the 1990s. Today, in Europe, Turkey, UK, and Norway, and on the other side of the Atlantic, the US and Canada happen to be the five non-EU NATO countries on the same boat, and any arrangement between the EU and NATO on common European foreign and security policy should be fair, just, and non-discriminative with regard to those five countries. At a time when NATO will be preparing a new strategic concept, and at a time when we are all expecting to recover the damage we all witnessed during the Trump administration, 
perhaps stronger UK-Turkey coordination should need to be enhanced at a wider format involving at least the US, but also perhaps Canada and Norway. Also, I think the European Union, as we hear particularly from France, is now exploring a new European defense identity, uh, should also look for closer coordination with NATO, but this should not be to the detriment of non-EU members of NATO. My fourth observation would be on UK's foreign policy. On a number of foreign policy issues, the United Kingdom's EU membership defined UK's foreign policy in close coordination with the EU foreign policy. For example, the UK was not a member of the Minsk group and did not have much involvement in the Azeri-Armenian conflict on Nagorno-Karabakh. In the South Caucasus, the situation in Georgia was also generally pursued by the European Union and sometimes even by individual countries such as Germany and France separately, but did not involve the United Kingdom much. Today, I think the UK would feel more independent and need less coordination with the European Union in a number of foreign policy issues around Turkey's neighborhood in the Black Sea region, in South Caucasus, in the Middle East, and also in the Eastern Mediterranean, this situation may help develop a new bilateral coordination on foreign policy matters pertaining to those geographies. And as we are talking about the trilateral coordination during the Biden administration, I think such an idea is perhaps quite relevant. My final observation is on Cyprus. I think it is fair to state that Turkey and the Turkish Cypriots are quite frustrated because of the fact that the Cyprus issue remains unresolved for almost five decades now. In 2017, in Kranz, Montana, it was also a, a, a unanimous conclusion uh, that the current format of negotiations would not yield any substantive result and that we should embark upon exploring alternatives for resol resolution of the Cyprus conflict. No need to underline that an equitable opportunity for resolution disappeared in 2004 when Cyprus was accepted as a member of the EU, in spite of the fact that the reunification of the island had not been achieved. What is more, in the referendum regarding the Annan plan, Greek Cypriots who refused the plan were rewarded by membership, whereas Cypriot Turks who approved the plan were punished and left outside the European Union. This decision was unfortunately the official division of the island by the European Union, and it was also the import of an unresolved conflict into the European Union. Today, Cypriot Turks are favoring a two-state solution and a civilized divorce, whereas Greek Cypriots are still insisting on the continuation of negotiations with a view to achieving bizonal, bicommunal federation. How to reconcile? On 27, 29 April in Geneva, a new round of five plus UN meeting will convene. It's not an official meeting and all the participants accept that the forthcoming Geneva meeting will try to explore whether there is a common ground for the official continuation of the talks between the two communities. I find it quite difficult to find a common ground in Geneva at the end of April. Recently, the United Kingdom has come forward with some ideas which could be summarized as a compromising alternative between the two extreme and maximalist positions of the two sides. Would it fly? I don't know. But the issue here is the United Kingdom is one of the three guarantors of the status of Cyprus defined and established through the 1960 London and Zurich agreements. And we have Brexit. The United Kingdom, although enjoyed the privilege of being one of the guarantors, had to pursue a careful and sensitive approach in the discussion about the Cyprus problem. Its membership in the European Union obliged the United Kingdom to be sensitive to the EU policies, not only because of membership, but also because of Greece and Cyprus also being members of the same group of countries. Today, thanks to Brexit, this is not the case anymore. This is the reason why there's an overwhelming enthusiasm on Brussels, uh, in Brussels to become a part of the process in Geneva or in its aftermath. Turkey and Cypriot Turks, however, do not look at this enthusiastic approach from Brussels favorably. The United Kingdom might be considerably independent and forthcoming in its performance as a guarantor and act really objectively because it should not feel bound with the EU solidarity anymore. But here's what I would like to submit to this webinar as a final bit. Brexit, having its advantages and disadvantages, both for the United Kingdom and the European Union, might become an opportunity for finding a visionary solution for the Cyprus problem too. Why should not we explore how the cases of Northern Ireland and Gibraltar could become an inspiration for the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus? Cyprus problem is not a problem between Turkey and the European Union. It's a problem between the two communities living side by side on the island. But Greek Cypriots want to transform this matter into a problem between Turkey and the European Union. 
If the European Union really desires to be helpful for the resolution of the Cyprus problem, I think it would be appropriate to look into this idea of being inspired by the results of Brexit in Northern Ireland and Gibraltar. This would certainly open a new horizon in Turkey's relations both with the European Union, but also with each and every individual member of it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Unal. Um, you covered a lot of important themes to which I'm sure we'll return throughout this evening. And I'm glad, grateful to you for raising a lot of these difficult issues in terms of that is and not just as threats. Um, our next speaker is Nicholas Banforth, Nick Banforth, who uh, works at Eliamet. That's the Hellenic Foundation for European and Foreign Policy. Well, that he was at the German Marshall Fund, so uh, there can be no one better qualified than him, I think, to cover the issue from looking at it from the United States of America. Nick. Thank you so much. Uh, delighted to be on here with all of you. I have to begin by thanking the British Institute at Ankara, uh, not just for having me here today, but for everything they've done uh, during the course of uh, my research. The very first time I went to Ankara, I actually stayed, well, I, people encouraged me to stay at the British Institute hostel. Uh, they did not have space at the hostel, so the British Institute kindly put me up in the laboratory, uh, where for a very reasonable price, I had a wonderful uh, month, uh, apartment to myself in Ankara shared only with a drawer full of camel skeletons. Uh, and in subsequent years have made use of the library, have made have met wonderful people through the British Institute's tea. So thank you to all of you and thank you on behalf of not just myself, but a number of other scholars. With that said, uh, you know, relatively good news on the US-Turkish relationship front. I think, you know, no news is good news at this point, uh, or rather no new crises is good news. Uh, when Biden came into office, there were wildly divergent expectations uh, on what this would mean for the U.S.-Turkish relationship. Uh, some expected we'd see some sort of reset. Others expected, I think, some kind of immediate train wreck. Uh, neither of these have happened. And I think all things considered, given where the relationship has been recently, that's for the best. Um, you know, the major problems, the structural issues between the two countries have not been solved. In many cases, they haven't even been addressed. Uh, but in spite of that, both sides seem happy to maintain a level of stasis, uh, not making anything worse. I, I think we should take that as a win. Um, the Biden administration clearly has a lot of other things on its plate uh, internationally, of course, even in the Middle East, um, you know, beyond uh, not just beyond the U.S.-Turkish relationship, but I think this is even worth stressing, you know, even beyond Syria that. The Syria issue so far has not been a high priority for the administration. It may become one, but you know they're focused on the Iran deal. They're focused on Yemen. Um, this has made it uh, easier to avoid tensions on the U.S.-Turkey front. There are certainly people on this panel who can speak more articulately than I can about why on the Turkish front, we seem to have seen uh, a pause. We seem to have seen a desire from Ankara for uh, increasing calm, both in relations with the EU and relations with the US. Um, I think the US's perspective right now is if, you know, the EU seems happy with the way things are going in the Eastern Mediterranean, that's fine from Washington's point of view. You know, again, the, the, we've seen uh, very tentative, but I think some real steps towards rapprochement with Egypt. There's still a lot of skepticism, uh, but this is certainly something that uh, Washington has been pleased with, uh, would very much like to see continue. Uh, if that continues apace, you know, again, I'm not sure anyone is expecting a major transformation of the dynamics in the Eastern Mediterranean, but, you know, the fact that we do have, we have talks going on, or preliminary pre-talks with Greece, we have the talks in Geneva that Ambassador Chevika has mentioned, uh, we have the rapprochement process with Egypt. You know, get, even if no one's expecting great things from all these, you know, major transformation, the very fact that they're happening is, I think, from Washington's point of view, much better than the alternative. Um, I guess I'll try to keep this quick so we can move on to all sorts of other things. Uh, 
the, you know, the, again, this dynamic could change very rapidly. Um, on the positive side, I think we have, you know, I'm not an expert on Ukraine or US Russian relations, but to the extent that the situation there clearly seems ominous. If you do have a dramatic worsening of US Russian tensions, I think that gives Turkey an opportunity to uh, relieve pressure um, on both sides of this, uh, the US Turkey Russia triangle. I think if you did have the, um, we did have a more serious conflict with the United States and Russia in Ukraine, uh, if Tur all Turkey would have to do is basically keep its head down. And I think you'd see uh, both Moscow and Washington very hesitant to do anything that might uh, worsen relationships with Turkey at that point. Um, you'd see, you know, I think in that situation, again, I'm not a Russia expert, but I, Moscow would be less likely to support um, an Assad regime offensive in Idlib. I think it would give Turkey breathing room. Um, you know, the other major issue on the US Turkish agenda, of course, is the Armenian genocide resolution uh, and presidential statement. People who have been following this seem convinced that Biden will actually make a statement about the genocide using the word uh, on the 24th. I, the whole thing strikes me as a little sorted by this point um, to the extent that there's clearly a, you know, for survivors of the genocide, for descendants of survivors of the genocide, this is enormously important. Uh, for their sake alone, I think it's the right thing to do. Uh, but given how uh, this issue has been politicized, given that the United States didn't uh, take a stand on this when it was politically inconvenient and waited until, you know, now it's more politically convenient because U.S.-Turkish relations have descended to such a level, you know, it makes it very hard for this to look like a principled statement or for it to have any real I would say positive uh, benefits in terms of encouraging a more serious conversation about this in Turkey. Uh, will it have a dramatically negative effect on US-Turkish relations? Again, I think there are people here who can speak better to what Ankara's reaction is likely to be from what we've seen uh, you know, recently with France, uh, recently with the United States passing uh, a congressional resolution on this last year. I don't think, again, I don't think this is a moment where Turkey is necessarily looking to go beyond scoring rhetorical points on this. I, we may well see, you know, the Turkish parliament pass a resolution recognizing America's genocide against the Native Americans. Uh, I think if Ankara wanted to do something that would really promote a historical reckoning in the United States, they might push the envelope a little bit and pass a resolution about the United States' involvement in say the uh, 1965 genocide in Indonesia. There's just been a wonderful book published about that by uh, Victor Bevan, I think. Uh, that would be, you know, if Ankara wants to be creative and actually get people in the United States talking, that would be an interesting route for them to go. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, I think this will be, there'll be some heated rhetoric around this and it will, you know, I think people always said, people said last year, in you know, the best case scenario, we'll just get the issue over with. Um, will, you know, the United States, Congress has already made its views clear on this. The president will make his views clear on this. Uh, and at some point in the future, when hopefully US Turkish relations are restored to a much better level, uh, this will have become routine and we won't have to worry about it as a crisis. Um, I could engage in more uh, reckless speculation about the future, but why don't I stop there and eager to yeah, talk about the future and questions if people have more. Uh, to ask about that. Thank you. Thanks very much, Nick. Um, yeah, the, the, your message, I think, is that neither side uh, wishes or your thoughts is worthwhile of, of a total breakdown in the relationship. Um, I must say, I think you were probably better off with the skeletons than in the, than in the hostel. As you probably know, there are two or three beds in each room of the hostel, in each bedroom. And you just had the skeletons. It, really, it was a wonderful, it's the, by far the best accommodation I've had in Ankara. And the location <laughs> is wonderful and the library access is wonderful. So I can't recommend it enough to anyone. I would even ask for the laboratory if that's still an option. <laughs> Good, okay. So um, our next speaker is John Golan, who um, is a considerable expert on Turkey. He served in Ankara when he was young and was subsequently an ambassador there in the 90s. Uh, and he, after that, he was the British permanent representative to the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, John. 
Thanks very much, David. I think we've set ourselves a horrible agenda here because we've got three countries, Turkey, the US and the UK, that are all going through quite turbulent times. And the direction of travel for each of these countries is pretty obscure. Um, I have no idea where my own country is going, still less where the United States and Turkey are going. So I'm not going to pontificate on today's events. What I can bring is a slightly different perspective because I can compare where we are now with where we were in the 90s when I was at, uh, in, in Turkey and, and at NATO. Um, and in the 90s, there was no doubt that genuinely there was a concern and a wish that Turkey should get closer to the European Union. That most countries wanted that to happen and they wanted to see, they attached a lot of importance to the model of Turkey as a successful Muslim democracy within the Euro-Atlantic world. Now, all of that, both on the Atlantic NATO side and on the EU side, that looks much more questionable today than it did 20 years ago. Let's start with Turkey EU, which is the sort of invisible elephant in this room since we don't have an EU speaker. Um, in the 90s, Turkey was really plowing ahead quite well in its negotiations for accession. The dossiers were the easy ones, but they were doing well and we were ticking them off. Um, we had hoped that it would build a momentum that would lead ultimately to some, some sort of membership or something very similar. But even then, there were four problems and all four of those problems have, I think, become more difficult to handle. I'll go through them one at a time. First, Greek obstructionism, one has to call it that. Um, I attended the first meeting of EU foreign ministers uh, where Greece joined as a member. And the then foreign minister called Haralambopoulos made a very emotional speech about how in no circumstances would Greece ever use her membership of the EU to the disadvantage of Turkey. Indeed, we should all think of Greece as a kind of bridge to Turkey. That was how it was going to be. Well, it didn't take long. It was certainly less than a year before Greece was actually using her membership of the EU to bind the EU countries closer to, Turkey's, to, to, Cy to Greece's positions, um, starting, of course, with Cyprus. And that obstacle became much stronger when the EU made its very unwise decision, in my view, to allow the Greek part of Cyprus to join as a full member, representing the whole of the island, in the advance of any kind of federal or confederal solution. Um, since then, we've got the uh, East Med gas problem, where we've seen EU countries and EU companies like Total moving even closer to the Greek positions. The second problem was the federalist one, because even in the 90s, countries like, uh, well, all the countries of the European Union that were strongly federalist minded, and particularly France and Germany, were beginning to realize that their plans for an ever closer federal structure in Europe didn't fit very well with the accession of Turkey. Um, that federal aspiration is, of course, much weaker now in practice than it was, but the aspiration is still there. People haven't lost it. Uh, and already we can see the EU is reluctant to take on even very small members um, and very, very frightened of the idea of taking on a country as big and important as Turkey. And that leads to the third problem, which was the EU defense identity. Um, the European defense effort is frankly, rather feeble, uh, and any extra efforts that the EU countries, that the Europeans make on defense, are going to have to be allocated primarily to NATO, if only to satisfy in part the burden sharing pressures that are coming from Biden, just as they came from Trump. So the reality is weak, but the aspiration is strong. And actually, creating institutions on paper is very cheap cost-free and quite rewarding. So every time there is a minor institutional change in the EU defense side, it creates problems for Turkey as an excluded nation. And the fourth, obviously, is the values problem. Uh, even more so than in the 90s, but strong already then, was this emphasis on the key values 
of uh, the collectivity. Uh, rule of law, independent judiciary, independent universities, uh, free press, human rights. On all those counts, I have to say, the external perception, it may be right or wrong, but the external perception is that things are worse than they were then. Now time will tell what happens to Turkish de democracy, and I'm fairly hopeful still about that. But the Turks we meet on the circuit and the Turks we meet traveling tend to tell us that the direction of travel is still wrong. So the obstacles on the EU front are greater than they were. And I think the likelihood is that the relationship will remain transactional. In other words, realpolitik deals about things like minor adjustments to the customs union, uh, uh, something to do with uh, the migration problems. Um, but that rather than a move towards institutional integration. Um, on the NATO side, it's very different. Turkey's always had a very strong card at NATO as a major stalwart ally. But even in the 90s, things were becoming a bit uncomfortable. Uh, over the Balkans in particular, Turkey was an outlier uh, for much of the mid 90s. And NATO EU cooperation was also a problem. The UK had a, a cunning plan to work out a deal under which the EU would not develop uh, defense and security institutions. Uh, uh, capabilities or, or structures, but would instead uh, use NATO structures and capabilities for those operations in which NATO had decided not to act. But Turkey blocked that. Turkey was uncomfortable with it. I mean, nothing, it wasn't taken forward and it went down a different route, as we know. Um, uh, at that time, in the 90s, the relationship be between Turkey and the alliance depended heavily on very strong therapeutic work by, by the US. I used to see that because I sat between the Turkish and US delegations on the NATO Council. Um, that role of the United States as the therapeutic intermediary and helper in that process is a good bit less effective for the reasons that Nick has described. Um, three other problems on the NATO front, one is values. NATO too in the last 20 years has begun to put much greater emphasis on values. The Brussels summit of 2018 talked about um, uh, common values, including individual liberty, human rights, democracy, and the rule of law. And hints from Turkey that, from Ankara, that things may be going in a reformist direction have so far not done much to convince outsiders. The second one is Putin's Russia. It's not a, it's an opportunistic relationship between Erdogan and Putin. Uh, there's a strong trade base, but otherwise it's opportunistic and probably not durable, certainly not reliable. But it has had an effect on Turkey's image as a stalwart pillar of the alliance. And finally, there's Syria, because there's a lot of concern in NATO about what's happening in northern Syria and whether Turkey is going to finish up, whether she wants it or not, with a zone of occupation. And that in turn feeds into rather worrying doubts about whether any resulting threats to Turkey would automatically trigger, trigger Article 5. But the bottom line on NATO is that Turkey, the UK and the US and most of the allies have an extremely strong interest in seeing European def uh, the defense of Europe centered on NATO and with Turkey as a very major participant in that. So that's a very positive bottom line. One or two quick words about Turkey and the UK, on which Yunal has already spoken admirably. Brexit has pluses and minuses. Uh, I felt as ambassador that our main value to Turkey in the 90s, right across the board, was that we were a major NATO, EU player and the strongest advocate of accession, as Yunal has said. Well, that's all over. That plus has vanished. But of course, outside the EU, um, we are freer to adopt more agile, less discriminatory policies. Treating Turkey as a major partner rather than as a problem country or a difficult third country as Turkey, uh, as, as Turkey is often seen in the EU. Even on visa policy, where I don't expect our policy is going to be much more liberal 
in the future. It will no longer be discriminatory against Turkey. Turkey will be treated on the same way as any other friendly country. And a key point that you now made, which I would like to stress, is that Turkey and the UK will be the most important non-EU countries in the region. We have an enormous interest in what goes on in the EU, in, for example, discouraging protectionism, which will be stronger. The trend to protectionism will be stronger now the UK is out. But in other things too, we've clearly got a very great interest in cooperating and comparing notes uh, on what's going on in the EU. Historically, we're much more interested in the wider world. So we tend to take a more global view. Of course, we have a lot of common global interests, um, not least climate, ecology, COVID, terrorism, uh, drug and people trafficking. Bilateral relations, there's a lot of ballast. We don't need to go into it. It's obvious. People, lots of people, 500,000 people of Turkish origin in the UK, large millions of Brits coming here on for tourism this year, as in previous years, we hope. Worth stressing that Turkey is probably one of the most Anglophone countries in the world, for which it's not the first language. So massive scope for cultural cooperation and cooperation with the universities, because Turkish students and Turkish academics fit better into the UK uh, academic world than uh, most people from other, other countries who haven't got English as their first language. Security, I'll be very interested to hear what Zia says, so I won't trespass. On Cyprus, of course, we're no longer tied to an EU position, but I can't see the UK quickly switching from the federal or confederal model to a two-state model. I mean, I think that's not going to be very realistic, and nor is it likely to be acceptable anyway to the other main participants. So something in the confederal area might be of interest. And one has to mention there are some less positive factors in the relationship. There's a, a lot of sympathy in, the, in Parliament and in the media for Kurdish aspirations, for example, though that's not a policy driver in the UK and won't be, I don't think. Johnson's own comments about Turkey have not always been very helpful, but I'm confident that our relationship will actually be shaped not by sentiment or personal relationships, but by a hard-nosed building on strong mutual interests. And there are many in Parliament, in the British media, and in the churches and the NGOs who are very well disposed and extremely interested in seeing that go forward. So three quick conclusions. Turkey's prime interest, let's be realistic, is going to be to have a decent modus vivendi with the European Union and the US. But there is also a very rich potential agenda for Anglo-Turkish cooperation, not only in defense, but on developments in the EU, trafficking, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and particularly new technologies and the new agenda items, which are not in the current trade deals, um, agriculture, uh, services, and the knowledge economy. Secondly, if we're gonna make the best of this, both countries are gonna to have to work a lot harder than they have been doing. We both have other distractions. Um, more important, immediate, pressing priorities. But we can't take each other for granted. Um, and as always in foreign policy, a lot will depend on what success we make of our economies in a post-COVID world. My final conclusion is that Turkey is, going to, is doomed to live in a very difficult neighborhood. It's a cold and lonely place. And the illusion that Turkey can maximize her influence in the world without having a very much closer and better relationship than she does today with the EU and the US and the UK is I think that it's an illusion. Um, there's a very strong need and a very strong mutual interest in Turkey becoming again, a very major participant in the Euro Atlantic world. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Uh, you you uh, range widely and raise, raise a lot of interesting, I think uh, many people will want to cover in the discussion later. Many thanks for that. Um, our last speaker uh, in the panel, among the panel, is Zia Meral. Zia is a fellow of the Royal United Services Institute, 
uh, and he's also uh, an instructor at the uh, Center for Historical Analysis and Research at the Royal Military Academy at Sandhurst. Zia, over to you. Uh, thank you so much, David. I think this is one of the great webinars where every speaker before me is so insightful that I was writing notes and actually if you forgot about me, I'll be really delighted by it. Um, just to build on actually from the points that has already been made, I think looking at it, first of all, from the kind of British foreign policy, defense and security policy, and how within that Turkey plays a new role and vis-a-vis -vis the integrated review and kind of quite robust actually talk through vision that we have seen set forward by the current government, right? So um, even though there's a lot to criticize on other portfolios, I've always been against Brexit, um, but I think the integrated review, the vision that is set out with that genuinely gives us a framework to conceptualize how Britain sees itself in the world, what it can achieve, what it seeks to achieve, and within that, what countries like Turkey mean. And then we can come back to it um, from an Ankara perspective and what Ankara sees in that too. So some of the key themes that emerge in the integrated review, which is shaping the British defense and security and foreign policies together, um, is an understanding of a world that is multipolar, that is driven by um, geopolitical competition, both by major powers, like China is mentioned, obviously it's, it's the biggest question for everybody in DC, as well as in London and European capitals, but also middle range powers. And I think that's a very important conversation, how middle range powers compete for superiority impact in their region and use that um, to, um, to have a role in international affairs. Is it a topic which UK is sensitive to, perhaps a lot more than United States, primarily because maybe because we have middle range power that has a privileged position and a heritage and a history and capabilities that allows itself um, to be able to deliver some of its interests globally with through allies and networks. So therefore what middle range powers do in geographies of importance for the UK has a lot of importance. Um, and I'll come back to why I'm singling this out when I kind of bring Turkey back into the picture. And if you look at, again, the integrated view, while obviously everybody rightfully paid attention to the language of tilt to Indo-Pacific region, again, vis-a-vis -vis the question of China, vis-a-vis -vis the, 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 the priority of the China question for the United States, but also serious challenges that rises from China's newly found assertive place in its region and globally. But the core of it is about transatlantic Europe security, right? So the core of UK's commitment, understanding its positioning is about maximizing its um, positioning as a, again, bridge between the US and Europe, taking um, a leadership role in European defense and security, not EU structures, but understood as in the European mainland, um, within which the question of Russia has always been a lot more important for the UK, immediate and direct, than some of the policy conversations in Washington DC. And so you actually seen integrated to you a very important commitment um, towards NATO, um, towards um, capabilities that will complement NATO, not just the 2% spending request that always comes from Trump, but also came from Obama as well. It's been a um, stable conversation, um, but UK actually spends more than 2% already at the moment, and it's likely to spend more on that. But, Beyond that, priority given to NATO actually, operationally, strategically, and in messaging is actually quite intensified with the, intent, with the integrated review. Um, so what that really means for Turkey, it's, uh, if you can pick up the themes that I've been teasing out of the integrated review, it's actually quite important, right? Not just the current government, but David Cameron, Theresa May, you can even go back to Tony Blair, there's been the Gordon Brown, there's been subsequent focus by British governments on this relationship as a bilaterally important relationship, a country that London doesn't want to let go um, in other directions, a country that UK, London sees a chance to work closely, transactionally, pragmatically, and when there are issues and concerns, raise them carefully, often you know, from away from the cameras and public polemics, but still be an ally, a partner that is careful in how it handles that portfolio. I think with the integrated review and with Brexit process, you see Turkey gaining importance in some aspects of this conversation, but also actually a lot of it is maintaining its importance for London. So London has been really consistent with Ankara, which is something that you hear a lot in Ankara as a point of appreciation. They know what to expect from London, right? That's not the same um, for what to expect from DC. DC changes a lot, <laughs> or even Brussels, or even other European capitals. London has been consistent in how it approached Turkey, how it saw Turkey, how it engaged with Turkey. And I think that's a point of strength for us. 
taking the conversation forward. And if you look at the key areas, counterterrorism, organized crime, narcotics, irregular migration, Russian activities, and a breadth of foreign policy issues from Crimea to Black Sea, stability in Eastern Mediterranean, even Libya, there is a lot that Ankara and London sees in similar perspectives and shares. So even on the question of Syria, even on Iraq in particular areas, actually, UK and Turkey don't necessarily see it much differently than each other. So that has given the policymakers, the diplomats and those engaged quite a kind of good, robust standing and understanding of each other and, and, and a possibility of exploit. The issues of Cyprus, obviously, it's very much there. But again, UK is seen as a partner, a stakeholder that could be fair, that could understand, that could actually um, lead us to hopefully a new breakthrough from everything that has been tried. Um, but it's also quite challenging, right? Um, so in Turkey is actually mentioned in the integrated review as part of the list of European countries, starting from the US, then goes down to France and Germany substantially, then to Ireland. And then Turkey is mentioned right after that in the cluster of European countries that are important for the UK to work with, to share similar security and defense concerns, deepen defense engagement, procurement, and et cetera. So that's why you've seen the visits by the defense secretary of both countries. Um, but it's also very tricky, right? Turkey's desire to have a strategic independence has often meant a cacophony of decisions that are sometimes personalized, sometimes not thought through, sometimes major mistakes like purchase of S-400s. Uh, um, we can jump into that, but I think all of us are tired of the question of S-400s. But also question of democracy and human rights. It's interesting that integrated view actually singles out promotional values in open societies. And interestingly, I think for the first time, mentions religious freedom as aspect of it, really singles it out. That I think was a unique thing. And looking at current nationalist religious politics in Turkey and symbolism given over to um, kind of dominating that space, even some of the discussions we've seen about laicite in Turkey, maybe changing of the constitution, increasing the number of religious schools and handling of non-Muslims and et cetera. I think that religious freedom actually question um, in Turkey, which is becoming more sensitive in London and House of Commons and Lords, but also for the public, is going to be a bigger challenge. And how do you handle when Ankara's foreign policy is also ad hoc and reactionary, sometimes very thought through, understandable, other times completely reactionary and inconsistent. Um, I think London also struggles with that. But nobody in NATO or nobody in London is able to walk away from that conversation. Perhaps that's because of geography. We're a lot closer to Turkey, issues relating to Turkey. NATO has $5 billion worth of assets in Turkey, ranging from radar systems to AWOC jets, AWOC jets to British personnel and US personnel, et cetera. There's a lot of military involvement and assets in, in Turkey that is not simply about injury base and shutting it down and moving on. So I think the view from London is quite matched by Ankara too. Um, Erdogan is always careful with how he communicates his discontent or issues with London publicly or in person. In fact, when Boris Johnson wrote that unfortunate poem right after he lost his job and he went away from politics before he became the prime minister back again, um, when he wrote that unfortunate poem with Douglas Murray's competition, when he then went to London, um, UK, Turkey as his first, I think, foreign visit as the foreign secretary, it was amazing to watch how they would both handle it. And I'm pleased to report that everybody handled it really gently and calmly and with only, I think, one or two awkward moments in silence away from the cameras. So I think that goes to show, again, as Sir John mentioned, both cities, policymakers see each other as important partners, knowing the limits of that conversation, but also opportunities. I think from a British perspective, with Brexit, with integrated degree, with our newly found kind of push in these geographies, there's a lot there that Turkey offers and UK would want to exploit that. From Ankara's perspective, there is a lot that UK offers from still the bridge position with European countries, with United States, working together on key issues in defense and security and diplomacy and key portfolios to actually this personal good relationship. And we have two British ambassadors here and we have a Turkish ambassador here. I think all of them have done a tremendously great job. I mean, I observed most of your careers you closely, personally and externally. We had, we've been really lucky to have top notch British and Turkish diplomats actually serving in each other's countries. Honestly, there hasn't been any scandal. And in fact, there's been a lot of goodwill and maturity based upon that. And that is actually really important because I think in the end of the day, personal relationships matter. So when geopolitical questions arise, crises emerge, how we find a way out of these, I think UK and Turkey have been more successful than US and Turkey relationships, which had a lot of 
personal issues and personality issues, as well as chaos of um, foreign policies. I'll end there, um, David, because I think a lot of people are asking questions and we can pick up issues. Oh, I think you're muted, David, which is the, 20, the year 2020 smoke, though, isn't it? You're muted. <laughs> That's better. How about that? That's it. Yeah. <laughs> um, thank you, Zia, very much indeed for your perspective. Um, and thanks to the whole panel. You've, you've raised, a, 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 gone over a wide range and raised a, a lot of things that I'm sure people will want to discuss. Um, we've got about 45 minutes or so for question and answer. Um, I can see a number of questions in the Q&A box, but also some in the chat box. Uh, and I'm going to take the questions in the Q&A box. Uh, and I would ask those people who put things in the chat box if they could they can't fall into questions in the Q&A section, because it, it's easier for, for, for me to handle. Um, so I'm going to start with the first question there, which is from Peter uh, Drusiotis, um, who makes the point, who argues that Turkey is punishing the Turkish and Cypriots and the Greek Cypriots by continuing to occupy Northern Cyprus, contrary to international law, and has installed a new Turkish Cypriot leader who is just Ankara's mouthpiece. Uh, his question, and I guess this question has to be for you now, is why will not Turkey leave the islands to the Cypriots themselves so that they can determine their own future rather than seek to dictate the terms of a solution through military reform. Thank you. Hmm. Thank you, David. Um, I couldn't catch the name of the uh, person who asked the question, uh, but uh, it is uh, for very obvious reasons, actually. Uh, what has happened in 1974 was, of course, to the detriment of the security of Cypriot Turks. And uh, there was a coup, uh, and that's the reason why uh, according to the London Zurich agreements, uh, Turkey, with consultation uh, with the other guarantors, uh, had to intervene. And since then, of course, uh, Turkey and the Turkish Cypriots uh, would like to see a guarantee that similar things would never happen again. And uh, I am afraid uh, in the last 40 years, uh, we have been unable to achieve a solution uh, which would guarantee the security of the Cypriot Turks living there. Uh, and the Cypriot Turks themselves uh, actually feel that uh, uh, the presence of Turkish armed forces, uh, uh, which has been actually decreased in number, uh, is uh, a very essential and uh, necessary uh, guarantee for their own security. Uh, once the resolution of the conflict is over, of course, so there will be a time when uh, the Cypriots uh, will uh, take all the necessary measures to guarantee their own security, and they will probably be not needing the presence of Turkish armed forces there. The Anand plan uh, was actually uh, guaranteeing that kind of a balanced presence, both for the Greek uh, uh, armed forces and the Turkish armed forces, but as you know, it was refused. Uh, as far as the uh, Ersin Tatar uh, uh, issue is concerned, uh, I think it was a fair race, uh, and uh, I know that Mustafa Akunji was favoring BBF, the Bizonal Bicommunal Federation, uh, Ersin Tatar uh, was, uh, uh, and I think I would agree there uh, with the person who has asked the question, was heavily influenced by the approach of AKP, uh, and uh, he is defending the two-state solution. Uh, but uh, I don't think that uh, he will be able to stick to that position uh, very uh, uh, strictly, uh, because uh, in Geneva, uh, both states are, or both sides are, starting from a maximalist position. And inevitably, if they really want to reach a, a conclusion, uh, they will have to make some compromises and they will have to find a way in between. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, you know, um, the next question, I think this is one for you, Nick, um, since you touched on this subject. It's a question from Henry Jones Davies. And he asks, what are the views what are your views on the thawing of Turkish-Egyptian relations? Does it have a future? Well, I was, oh, sorry. Yeah, no, please. No, I, I, like many other people, was very skeptical at first. It seemed the first uh, news about this uh, thaw, this rapprochement, came from Ankara. It was at a moment when uh, Ankara seemed to be announcing that it was having a rapprochement with virtually everyone, uh, making very optimistic statements about 
you know, improved relations with the U.S., with the EU, with um, Egypt, with Greece, with Saudi Arabia, with the UAE, even with Armenia. Uh, some of the initial statements about, you know, that when the Turkish foreign minister said that they were on the verge of signing a uh, maritime delimitation agreement with Cairo that was very quickly um, rejected by the Egyptian government. So again, there was, there was a lot of skepticism going into that. There were also concerns, obviously, that everyone knew Egypt's bottom line seemed to be the Thing we've been stopped by Egypt or some other states <laughs> I think that's a want to freeze that comment. Um, but I'm, I'm happy to throw this, some thoughts on yeah. that too, David, if it helps while Nick reconnects. And yes, I also I also have some comments on that question. Good, let, let me let me uh, allow Zia to go first. Sure. I mean, so I followed Egypt-Turkey relations a lot over the years. You know, I, I was doing a lot more field research in Egypt in a previous life and was there when Erdogan, you know, was welcomed as a superhero, basically before the Arab, after the Arab Spring and before the Morsi presidency and how relationships went sour. I think at its core, um, the relationships at the moment are really difficult to repair and fix. The mistrust in both capitals are given. Um, there's a legacy of how the Arab Spring happened and the whole Muslim Brotherhood question, what Erdogan said and what Sisi did, what happened in Egypt and how it became a domestic political issue in both countries, right? Erdogan, you know, raising four fingers and, uh, to come capture Rabah incident, and also in, in Egypt as well, too, it's seen as an intense intervention in their own domestic politics. But add to that is the geopolitical competition between the two, vis-a-vis -vis the question of Libya, the question of natural resources and the, in, in the, the waters in Eastern Mediterranean, and the new alliance that has grouped against Turkey with Egypt, UAE, Israel, Egypt, Cyprus coming together. So within this context, I think Cairo has a lot less incentive than Ankara to normalize relationships. And Cairo, from the way that they see the region and the world, also what has happened between the two, has a lot less desire and to be able to move on from it. But at the same time, let's not forget both states have a deep tradition of intelligence services that are able to compartmentalize issues and work on specific portfolios. That's what Egypt, Egypt did with Israel and with other countries um, and Turkey has done as well. So the meetings between Egyptian and Turkish intelligence and others, I think in Libya is going to be perhaps the only kind of positive thing where they could come up with a transactional understanding of how they can share, can share it. Uh, well, now, in terms of bilateral okay. relationships and domestic politics, I doubt it. Oh, did I get yes. stuck as well? That was Egypt, probably. Uh, it's clearly been stuck. <laughs> thank, thank you, sir. Um, Nick, yeah, I guess probably it is the souls of the pharaohs. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, I, I very much yeah, agree yes. with Zia, and uh, I think uh, the main reason for uh, any attempt coming from the uh, AKP or from Ankara uh, to correct or to recover the relations uh, that has been interrupted for more than seven years now is simply because Turkey is feeling very much isolated in the region, in the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, and uh, that has resulted with some kind of a, a revision of the AKP foreign policy vis-a-vis uh, -vis the West, uh, the United States, the European Union, NATO, that uh, we have already discussed, but also to the countries in the region. And that is the reason why uh, Turkey uh, apparently has uh, uh, stopped uh, the broadcast of the Muslim Brotherhood-related television channels in Turkey. And this is something which uh, has been uh, uh, very much uh, desired by the Brit by the uh, uh, Egyptian side, and uh, I think this is now being delivered. And Egypt, of course, from that point uh, of view, is quite happy. Uh, but of course, as Zia mentioned, uh, there are still some issues uh, being related to the uh, situation in Libya. Uh, uh, the sides were on the different uh, uh, positions. Uh, Egypt was uh, very much in favor of supporting uh, the, uh, uh, the the uh, uh, parliament uh, in a uh, uh, in the west, in the east, whereas uh, Turkey was uh, developing extensive relations with the national accord government in Tripoli, and that of course created a basic uh, difference between the two countries. Now, uh, Turkey, uh, I'm afraid, uh, is obliged uh, to uh, 
uh, to recover the relations between uh, Turkey and Egypt because uh, Turkey sees that uh, the developments in the Eastern Mediterranean is not uh, in its favor, but it is developing in its disadvantage. Uh, Greece and uh, Cyprus and Egypt are uh, uh, getting involved in uh, several multilateral uh, initiatives. Uh, the East European Gas Forum, for example, excludes Turkey, uh, which involves seven countries in the Mediterranean. And all these uh, oblige Turkey, in a way, to look at uh, Egypt uh, or to rediscover the importance of Egypt as a very important actor in the Eastern Mediter Mediterranean. There is one mistake, however, that I have to underline. Uh, AKP is looking at it uh, from a very short-sighted uh, point of view, uh, looking at Egypt only as an important actor in the Eastern Mediterranean and uh, uh, to, to advance its own interests in the uh, delimitation of the, the uh, maritime boundaries or the continental shelf and the exclusive economic zone issues. But Egypt is beyond that. And Egypt is a very important actor in Africa. And uh, that's the reason why uh, Turkey should look at Egypt, not only as an Eastern Mediterranean country, but as a Middle Eastern country and also as an African country. And uh, if you look at uh, Egypt from this uh, holistic approach, then you will probably have a much uh, deeper and much uh, stronger relations uh, with Egypt. Thank you. Nick, you were cut off in mid-flow earlier. Would you like to say anything more on the subject? One very minor thing to add, if um, Zia didn't cover this already while I was gone. Um, my only day, I, it does seem very encouraging now that both sides, both Egypt and Turkey, have gotten on board with the peace process that's currently taking place in Libya and seem to think that the composition of the current government gives them both and to opportunities to advance their influence uh, through a united government rather than through backing opposing sides. Uh, it does seem like the issue of the uh, Turkish Libya maritime agreement is going to be a really difficult one for the Libyan government to deal with. I mean, you've already seen uh, conflicting uh, stances from the president and the prime minister in a matter of days. Uh, over whether or not the new United government will continue to honor the agreement with Turkey. I don't, I, without knowing again, the details of the Libyan, um, the way the Libyan peace process is set up, that seems like a very, unless Turkey is willing to just kind of quietly drop this issue and let it sort of fade away. I don't fully see how you get both sides, both aspects of the government in Libya to come to a, consistent joint position on this. Um, maybe there's some kind of way to diplomatically finesse it. So Schrodinger's cat style, the government remains bound and not bound to this agreement at the same time. But that I think that's going to be a real, uh, you know, I said the development so far seem positive, but that remains as I think the potential uh, crux of the issue going forward. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Nick. Um, I've got a couple of questions now from Jeffrey Edson. Uh, he asks, first of all, whether uh, any of the panels think there is a role for a moderator of some sort, third country the moderator between the United States and Turkey. Uh, the other is uh, perhaps a rather more difficult one, which is has to do with Turkey's defense structure and policies. Uh, the question is, does the Ottoman Empire's history as membership of, as a member of the Central Powers Alliance in the First World War uh, impact or affect, or affect the way that uh, Turkey looks at defense policy now? Um, I give this to anyone who'd like to answer these questions. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to throw in some thoughts with Sir John if you wanted to say something too. But my, um, my, it, it, I, I think Turks, I don't know, as an outlook in life, finds multilateralism a bit more difficult, <laughs> I think than maybe the UK does. And I often get the sense that um, what they want is bilateral relationship with people and actually well, kind of groupings don't really work nice. In, 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 in other words, I think UK being kind of like a kind of facilitator US Turkey relations is unlikely because the two countries can talk directly and they want to, but, um, but could it be a translator and enabler and diffuse some of the tensions likely? Um, and I think that is going to go through, again, specific portfolios. Coming to Turkish defense policies, 
it's been fascinating to observe, right? So purely looking at it from Turkish national interest perspective, what Erdogan and Erdogan's government has been trying to do last 10 years has been talked a lot by other Turkish governments in 70s, 80s, 90s about um, nationalization of Turkish defense industries, um, achieving kind of national capabilities. So like in the Cyprus crisis in 70s, you faced a blockage and you, you, know, you faced section, sanctions against you. If you remember Ismail Jam, who was the um, foreign minister and turned politician, which said they died a lot younger than all of us have hoped, even he had spoken about similar kind of perspectives on the need for Turkish national defense. There's been a lot of white papers from Ankara over the years. So in that perspective, I think there's a lot of rationality to how much of investment there is from Ankara on defense technologies. Look, we've seen how they develop drones and electronic warfare capabilities and joint fires. Those three capabilities were not really there in Turkish kind of playbook that much. Um, and what they've done in Syria and what happened in Karabakh is obviously debated a lot, but what they've done in Syria in response to Turkish soldiers being killed by most likely to be Russians and Assad has actually been really impressive purely from a military analytic perspective um, uh, in terms of how they brought multiple firing capabilities together, how they deployed electronic warfare, how they use drones. And a lot of that has also gone through national industries and national products, which are never purely national, but it goes to show actually we are witnessing a Turkey that is actually jumping into um, the league of nations that can have their own capabilities, which is a strategic development. Now that's where the challenge begins. If you have those capabilities and strategic positioning, what is your ultimate vision? And I think to that comes the inconsistency of Erdogan government. Um, do you want to be a regional power that can get along with everybody? Well, clearly, you also want to assert yourself because you see groupings against yourself. And unless power is feeding your diplomacy and your diplomacy is ultimately driven by the solution and finding a way forward, then that power becomes a vulnerability. And I think in Turkish case, sometimes that power has become a vulnerability in Syria, um, Turkey is entrenched more and more and more without a clear exit. Or in Libya, Turkey is entrenched understandably. And then what is the exit, actually? So Turkey asserted itself over energy exploration in Cyprus uh, and, and around Cyprus, understandably, wanted to be heard. But then where is the diplomacy to build on from that? So defense assertion and technology alone doesn't really translate into long-term foreign policy successes. And I think that's where, at the moment, Ankara is suffering from a um, couple of decades or maybe last decade or last five, six years of intense polemics with leaders and intense kind of domestic or political um, shenanigans, which really kind of weaken Turkish diplomatic credibility in Europe, in US, even in London, um, to a certain extent, where that, therefore the defense successes often don't translate into influence, but just the bare minimum. And I think that's the threshold Ankara is struggling to pass at the moment, which is diplomacy. What is the diplomatic vision to build on the defense policy? I'm not sure. Maybe you know they might have another perspective. Thank you, Zia. Um, you know, would you have anything to say on the historical perspective? Yes, mm -hmm. not on the historical perspective. I don't have much to add to, to, to Zia's remarks. Uh, but about the moderation issue, I think uh, mm. uh, I, I, I have always admired the understanding of uh, the UK uh, uh, of different geographies. And I think uh, that's an enormous asset. Uh, as I uh, emphasize the importance of the UK support for Turkey's bid for uh, EU membership, uh, and now that we are deprived of this advantage, I think, uh, uh, although Zia said that Turkey and the US, US have the possibility of uh, talking to each other bilaterally, I think it is uh, difficult for Turkey and the US to understand each other. Whereas the United Kingdom uh, is... Uh, much uh, more able to, to know and to understand the two sides, both the US and Turkey. And I think uh, it is in that sense, uh, uh, it would be an enormous asset if the UK uh, could perhaps try to find uh, a, a kind of a moderation between US and Turkey. The role that it had played between Turkey and the US and, and the EU, now probably uh, the UK uh, uh, could, uh, could overtake some kind of a role uh, in finding a solution to the difficulties that the U.S. and Turkey are suffering from bilaterally. Thank you, Now, uh, Would John or Nick... Yes, like can say... I just chip in a couple of comments? I mean, the, the legacy of the First World War is a lot of ignorance on our side, uh, but a lot of respect for 
the performance of the Turkish military, particularly their success in beating, in kicking us out of Turkey in the early 1920s. Um, but that respect has been built up by, uh, in practical ways, in subsequent cooperation, not least, of course, in Korea. Um, uh, I don't think uh, there's any resentments of any kind from that period, whereas, of course, in Turkey there is. I mean, there's the Sevres complex and that sort of thing. There is no complex the other way on that, and probably not very important in either direction. Um, the UK clearly isn't going to insert itself as a as, as a problem solver between the US and Turkey, partly because their relationships are so intense, even when they're not good, they're as intense as they could possibly be. We do have an enormous interest in them getting on better. And Turkey-US relations will be part of our dialogue with the US, as it will be in part of our dialogue with Turkey. We have a vast interest in building that up as part of the uh, Atlantic uh, basis of defense. Um, on industries, I mean, the, the, what, what Turkey's done over the, zoo, over the drones is very impressive and in several other areas. But there are big question marks over who, where, what, what's, where's the fighter aircraft going to come in the future? What sort of fighter aircraft is it going to be? How is it going to be developed? I, I think there's a really serious problem there which hasn't yet been, been answered. Uh, but we've always been keen on defense cooperation. BAE systems very, very keen on, on, on defense contracts with Turkey, involving technology change and partnership as well. And I hope that will be part of a, a reinforced dialogue between these two most important countries outside the European Union in the European zone. Nick, anything would you like to add? Okay, thanks very much. Um, the next question is from Uut Pamak Sus, a topical question. He says, what do the panelists think about the recent discussions in Turkey regarding the Montre Convention and Turkey's position in the Ukraine-Russia conflict? Thank you. Um, yeah, Uyunabe, I, mean, yeah, I mean, yeah, please do. Yeah. Yeah, well, uh, Montre, uh, uh, the discussion about Montre Convention is over, actually. And uh, uh, I think uh, Erdogan himself has, has closed this discussion. Uh, the discussion actually uh, has a background of about uh, uh, three or four years uh, when the first project of the Canal Istanbul came into uh, the discussion in the public. Uh, and uh, the rediscussion of the Montreux Treaty was opened because of the tension between Ukraine and Russia. Uh, and uh, it was again related to the uh, building of the Canal Istanbul project. I think uh, today uh, everybody is uh, of the opinion that uh, Montreux uh, is not to be discussed and it is a, a very dear convention, uh, which is uh, uh, an essential a document which guarantees uh, the sovereign rights of uh, Turkey uh, in the uh, uh, passage between uh, the Black Sea and the Aegean. And also uh, now uh, Erdogan is also uh, making it clear that uh, it doesn't have anything to do with uh, Canal Istanbul. Uh, if we go deep into the interpretation and the uh, uh, international law aspect of uh, the uh, Montreux uh, uh, Convention. I think it will be a very long discussion. I have a view, of course, uh, but uh, uh, I, I don't think that it is a, a very a, a important agenda item anymore in Turkey. About the Russia-Ukraine uh, issue, I think it is also uh, being downplayed, uh, uh, and uh, I hope there won't be any uh, tension uh, in the Black Sea, uh, of course, uh, uh, almost all the parties uh, in Turkey in the political spectrum uh, do not accept uh, the uh, annexation of Crimea uh, by Russia, uh, but it's a fact. And uh, uh, I think uh, we all have to find a resolution to this uh, situation uh, rather peacefully. Uh, and uh, much of the responsibility is uh, on the uh, 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 on the Western uh, countries, uh, particularly uh, the European countries and also the United States. Uh, I don't think that uh, there will be a, uh, a very hot uh, conflict uh, between Russia and Ukraine uh, at this moment. Thank you. Now, um, John, would you like to say anything more about Ukraine-Russia? No. Um, Nick? Mm. 
Yes. No. I just say a few words about Montreux, just because right. this whole debate has been fascinating. Um, the Erdogan's position on the convention as a whole seems a little like his position on the Lausanne Treaty, in that you had these major diplomatic accomplishments of the Turkish Republic in the 1920s and 30s that from the perspective of where Turkey was at the end of World War One, I, I were dramatic and major achievements of the Turkish government um, and were recognized as such at the time and were promoted as such by uh, Ataturk and his followers. I think the problem is that when instead of comparing those achievements to what, you know, kind of realistic um, geopolitical outcome for Turkey at the time would have been when you compare those treaties to a kind of fantasy of what you would imagine Turkey achieving, which is what I think Erdogan is doing in some cases. I mean, yes, if you look at where the borders drawn by Lausanne vis-a-vis -vis the borders that were going to be imposed by Sevr, it's a huge achievement. If you compare those borders to a fantasy in which Turkey maintained Greek Thrace and the Aegean Islands and Mosul, it looks like a failure. And that's the, I think, completely unrealistic lens that Erdogan has been imposing on that. With Montreux, it seems very similar. You know, given the, you know, again, after World War I, the world was going to internationalize the entire Bosporus, uh, as well as Istanbul. Compared to that, the fact that Montreux gave Turkey the ability to militarize the Straits and in practical terms control which ships went through that, uh, went through the Straits, was a huge achievement. Compared to what I can only imagine is the alternative of a sort of complete unfettered Turkish discretion over which ships pass through or don't pass through the Straits, uh, you could um, see how Montreux could be presented as constraining Turkish sovereignty. Uh, I don't know if that's actually what Erdogan's saying, but that does seem to be uh, the thinking behind some of the people who have criticized Montreux. Uh, what's strange to me about the way this whole debate began is that my sense um, is that it actually started, you know, that before there was any talk on Erdogan's part about changing the Montreux Convention, uh, conspiracy theories started to spread amongst the anti-Erdogan, anti-Western uh, factions in Turkey, suggesting that the Canal Istanbul was actually part of a secret plan by Erdogan to bypass the Montreux Convention on the part of the United States. Uh, in recent political developments with the detention of uh, 12 Turkish admirals after they criticized Erdogan for withdrawing, or for mentioning the possibility of withdrawing from Montreux, suggests that some of these conspiracies are still alive and well, uh, it almost seems, and maybe this is too speculative, it almost seems like once the accusations, once the conspiracies began that Erdogan was going to secretly try to withdraw from Montreux and at the behest of the United States, uh, Erdogan's obviously not doing this at the behest of the United States. There's no behest from the United States. Uh, but that the suspicion on the part of Erdogan's enemies that he was going to try to withdraw from Montreux somehow led him to actually, or led people around him to think that maybe this was a good idea, or maybe they should reserve the right to do this anyways. And it almost seems like with some of the rhetoric that the government has had, um, you know, thankfully, as uh, Ambassador Cevico says, this issue seems to have been closed, but it almost seems like more of Erdogan's rhetoric was focused on just emphasizing that if he wanted to do this, he reserved the right to do it and wasn't going to allow anyone to criticize him for potentially doing it even if there was no real reason to think that he wanted to do it in the first place. Thanks very much. Thanks, thank you all. Um, I've got a question here from Edward Asquith, uh, who says, could he ask what is Turkey's perspective on the Iran situation and tensions with Israel and on the growing war, war of words against Russia and China? Thank you very much. Um, uh, where should we start? Uh, you again enough for, uh, for example, Iran and Israel? Um, about the Russia Ukraine thing, I think we have already uh, yeah. answered that question. Yeah. Uh, about Iran, um, I, 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 I am very much uh, interested in how the United States policy vis a vis Iran will develop. Uh, Biden administration, of course, was uh, very much willing uh, to uh, revisit the JCPOA, uh, and uh, there has been some attempt uh, to, to, to reach out to Iran in that respect. Uh, both sides, uh, both the United States and Iran, know and declare that uh, a new discussion of the JCPOA 
uh, will have to start and uh, its content and its framework will probably change. It will not be the same JCPOA that has been agreed, but unfortunately uh, uh, annulled uh, by Trump. Uh, and uh, I think uh, the European participants and Russia also uh, uh, agree that uh, uh, it's rediscussed. Uh, but of course, we have to wait the uh, result of the Iranian elections. Uh, Turkey has been always in favor of the JCPOA, and Turkey was not in favor of its uh, uh, annulation uh, by Trump. Uh, we will have to wait uh, the result of the Iranian elections and how this uh, rediscussion of the JCPOA between uh, the United States and Iran will start. Now, uh, about Israel, uh, uh, I'm afraid uh, we, we, are, we have a more or less a similar situation uh, like we have in the relations between Turkey and Egypt. Uh, the uh, Turkish-Israeli relations are also uh, interrupted uh, because we don't have ambassadors. Uh, and uh, both sides, uh, Erdogan and Netanyahu, uh, have uh, lost confidence and trust to each other. Uh, but of course, uh, both countries uh, know that uh, strategically uh, they need better relations. There are also some attempts uh, to uh, uh, establish contact and uh, to restart some kind of a, 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 a rapprochement between the two countries. Uh, but I think that also requires some time and uh, we will have to see how Netanyahu will proceed with the formation of the new government and uh, how he will, uh, uh, he will uh, uh, increase his chances uh, uh, to, to renegotiate with Turkey. If I may add, David, on yes, I was going to ask question. you. Yeah. Um, no, 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 thank you so much. Um, I think Turkey has been quite consistent on its relationship on with Iran on these issues, right? I mean, Turkey and Iran have been in competition with each other for so long, so there's never been this kind of alliance that was emerging. In fact, when NATO based its radar in southeastern Turkey, the statements that came from Tehran and the Revolutionary Guards was unbelievable. They were like, if there's ever a crisis, the first missile will hit Turkey. You know, So the mistrust in both capitals to each other runs deep. And also Turkey has often seen Tehran as um, kind of playing double-handedly, working with them on some PKK-related issues, but then also engaging with PKK on other issues. Um, so the mistrust, the geographic competition between them has been very deep. When it came to the nuclear enrichment issues, Turkey has also been consistent. They do not want to nuclear Iran, right? And they don't want that neighborhood to go down that way. And thankfully to this day, there is no actual movement in Turkey to say, hold on a second, everybody is remodernizing their nuclear arsenal. Everybody's trying to get nuclear weapons. Why are we left behind? So I'm so glad, maybe I shouldn't even jinx it in mentioning it. And in fact, even Ankara and Brazil, if, if you remember, there was a, a kind of parallel initiative which Erdogan has undertaken with Brazil to kind of offer another way which Tehran didn't welcome, it wasn't interested in. Interestingly, Turkey is closer to the European views on Iran than actually the United States one. And Turkey has a lot to lose from any sanctions or any escalation of this crisis. And Turkey rightfully also needs to buy energy from Iran, needs to trade with Iran, and it's got a land border with Iran. So that has often meant that Turkey has emerged as direct or indirect way Iran used to bypass US sanctions. The gold trade we have seen, how that was a blatant way <laughs> Iran wanted to exploit that opportunity. But there are also now free trade zones based in Turkey that can accommodate some of the transactions and the other structures that can be used. So that financial aspect of that relationship, which I think some of the US perspectives really miss out on the fact that Turkey needs that financial engagement. Turkey needs that energy engagement with Iran. Turkey needs to find a way to work with Iran, even though at the same time it's in competition with Iran in Syria, right? It's in competition with Iran in Iraq. It's in competition with Iran in Central Asia. I mean, if you remember in Iran and Turkey were competing for influence in even Azerbaijan at one stage and other Turkic countries in Central Asia. So that geopolitical competition has been so deep between them. So to that extent, I'm often surprised on how Israel have not been able to exploit that between Iran and Turkey to use it as a portfolio to work with Turkey um, on some of these issues and find ways to manage that. But I think at the moment from Israel's perspective, the need kind of neatly found up rapprochement it's enjoying with UAE, with Saudi Arabia, with Egypt, with Greece, with Cyprus, kind of overweighs in significance. And US policy towards Turkey is turning away. Greece's importance is increasing. 
for US, even to US's attitudes on Cyprus are changing. So I think from an Israeli perspective, you know, Turkey with its backing of Muslim Brotherhood related groups, ambivalence about initial phase of ISIS, but for Israel, mostly the question of Iran and bypassing of sanctions and these polemics between Netanyahu and Erdogan. I think from Tel Aviv's perspective or Jerusalem's perspective, um, at the moment, it doesn't stack up actually, or, you know, because at the moment, bashing Turkey gets Israel a lot more closer to UAE and Saudi Arabia. Actually, uh, deeply with Turkey, which it doesn't trust. Thank you, Zia. Um, John, Monik, would you like to add anything? No, okay. Thanks very much. Uh, we have a question from a, an anonymous attendee. Oh, but it's that's the Chinese government after that. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, absolutely. Um, well, possibly not when I ask the question. Uh, the question, the, the he or she uh, says that in the past, the Department of Defense in, in, in Washington, the Pentagon, would defend the U.S.-Turkey relationship when Congress and the White House tended to do the opposite. Um, the question, I think, perhaps this must be for John. Is there a part of the British government which is a particular driver of uh, the uh, UK-Turkish relationship you know, in the government, uh, while others are less less keen? The deep state, Sir John, the English version of the deep state, they didn't have let. It's very difficult to find. It's very difficult for me to think of a department that would be strongly lobbying against a closer relationship with Turkey. The intelligence community clearly want it. Uh, people who are concerned with migration clearly want it. The Defense Department and Trade Departments clearly want it. The Foreign Office certainly wants it. Um, I can't think of a, and clearly the Cabinet Office and the Prime Minister's Office would also want that. I, I don't think there's going to be a big anti-Turkish lobby in the British bureaucracy. Um, the problem will be to make sure that people are reminded every morning when they get out to bed that Turkey is one of these important medium-sized countries with whom we've got to get more closely into business if the post-Brexit agenda is going to be successful. I think going back to the earlier question about Iraq, Iran and Israel, I think one of the big pluses for Turkey in the eyes of the British bureaucracy is that we see Turkey, forgetting about the recent years when there's been a bit of turbulence, but in, over, the, over the decades, Turkish foreign policy and defense policy has shown an enormous maturity a hard-nosed realism. And that is a very positive thing in our world because we don't have much of it about. So comparing notes with those Turks who are dealing with these subjects is a big plus for us. And I assume it is the other way. Thanks very much, John. Um, the next question is from Daniel MacArthur Seal, who is the Deputy Director of the PIAA in Ankara. Uh, his question is this. One of the issues that the United States and the United Kingdom has put on the foreign policy agenda, at least rhetorically, is the promotion of LGBT rights. Now, the LGBT community movement has increasingly become a scapegoat for attacks by the Turkish government and its local allies. And Dan is, would like to, to ask the question if he thinks that the panel feels that this might become a, a sort of tension between Turkey and its allies. Thank you. Uh, you know, as usual. <laughs> mm. Well, this LGBTI issue, of course, is uh, uh, from our perspective, from the Republican People's Party uh, perspective, it's a human rights issue. And uh, there is uh, a very different approach of the AKP because of, uh, how would I say, uh, some fundamentalist religious uh, approaches. Uh, uh, they have uh, unfortunately victimized the LGBTI group in the Boazici University, Bosporus University events. Uh, and uh, that is simply just because of the, as I mentioned, the, the religious and the fundamentalist approaches, uh, which are feeling themselves very uh, influential in the AKP circles. Uh, Erdogan uh, has made it very clear that LGBTI is contradictory to our traditions, our so-called traditions. I don't know what those traditions are, uh, but uh, there is a very considerable part of the Turkish uh, people uh, uh, and uh, mainly uh, those uh, who are in opposition to uh, the AKP, 
They see this issue as a major human rights issue, and it may become an issue between Turkey and the Council of Europe uh, uh, in the future, uh, if not uh, uh, an issue between uh, other European countries and the United States. The United States, Biden, uh, President Biden made it very clear that the LGBTI rights are uh, something that will be on their agenda. Thank you, Ralph. Would anyone else like to comment on that point? Deep water with our plunge in. Um, I think it's a problem for the AKP, definitely. Uh, it's not a problem between other countries and Turkey as a whole, because the sort of Turks that most Europeans deal with are not particularly phased about um, this problem, and they take largely a, a similar attitude to, to most of that of most Europeans. But don't underestimate the negative effect of the powerful lobby that the LGBT community now constitutes. I'm not saying that it shouldn't happen. I think it's a good thing, but it is very powerful influence on governments in all countries. And a, a government that is trying to get a better relationship with natural old time allies uh, would need to bear that in mind. Uh, it's an unnecessary aggravation to Turkey's relations with other countries uh, in the West. And uh, it shouldn't be prioritized by a wise Turkish government that is planning a new reset strategy over the next few years. Nick, you wanted to comment? Yeah, I just echo that. I mean, it's, you know, I delighted that now in the United States, we have a government that's on, uh, I would say, the right side of this issue that clearly rhetorically has uh, supported LGBT rights in foreign policy made consistent and principled statements on this. You know, again, Biden has been very clear that he wants to have a more values-based, human rights-based foreign policy. I think there's good reason for a little bit of cynicism here. But as we just heard, I think the real issue, you know, it's not like Biden is ever going to impose sanctions over Erdogan's policy uh, towards LGBT rights in Turkey, but it's just one more thing that's going to stand in the way of improved relations. It's one more rhetorical point for everyone in the United States who opposes, uh, who would oppose any kind of rapprochement with Turkey on human rights grounds. Um, and yeah, it's a very public issue and it's one that, you know, clearly mm -hmm. resonates with a lot of people as it should. Thank you very much. Um, I'm conscious of time passing uh, and I'm going to skip over a second question from mm -hmm. Peter Druciotti. I hope you'll forgive me. We could come back to it later because I'd like to get on to an entirely different subject. Uh, here's a question from George Limos, who asks about Halk Bank case, Zarab and so on, and its possible effects. Uh, I think this one is prime, well, first of all, for Nick. No, that is an excellent question. I'm going to avoid saying anything. Um, well, I'm going to be cautious on what I say, because I actually don't know how this is likely to play out. Um, other than that, it is going to go forward. Um, you know, everything I've heard makes it sound like barring some kind of negotiated settlement, uh, there will eventually be a judgment uh, and fines against Hulk Bank, which, you know, I mean, range in the billions of dollars would be very substantial. Um, this, again, I think it's probably too late to solve the S-400 issue. Uh, if there was the will and the diplomatic uh, wherewithal to, in the uh, commitment on Ankara's side, in the, to solve this through some kind of, you know, I think mostly these cases, my understanding is in the past when they've involved banks and other countries, the uh, US Justice Department and the uh, bank itself have reached a settlement before a judgment is uh, rendered. I hope that will be the case here. If anyone has more detailed information, I'd be eager to hear it as well. Any further comments? No, I, I must say, I think it's a, a very big elephant in the room myself. Um, the next question is from Fyodor Robinson. Um, Fyodor asks, with both the United States and the United Kingdom taking stronger positions against China on the Uyghur question, what are your expectations of Turkish stand towards China? causing serious rift with its traditional allies? Yeah. Uh, a good question. Uh, 
happy to throw in some ideas before this. Mm, I think initially Erdogan actually was one of the first people to draw attention to the Uyghur suffering. If you remember on, on one of his official visits to China, he even got the permission to land in Xinjiang first before he actually went to meet with the central government, which was impressive that both Chinese and Ankara actually made that happen. But his, his route was pretty much blocked. They could only see literally a particular journey and he wasn't really happy with the engagement with the Uyghurs. Um, but I think that initial kind of raising the Uyghur cause as an important aspect of Turkish domestic policy, I mean, politics, which there's always kind of East Turkestan language of these are the Turkic people that are suffering, um, has kind of fizzled out actually last two, three years. Um, primarily because of Chinese strong hand on investments and some of the part, particularly financially, that at the moment Erdogan needs financing because you know the credit rating is really low with Western funders, European country companies, and states and etc. Versus Chinese interests are not tied with what Turkey does and all mm. these issues that we mentioned, which are very important. But obviously, Chinese investment follows another path, and also the Belt and Road Initiative, which is the latest name given to the kind of decades long Chinese ambitions for this trade route on all these geographies, which Turkey has seen itself to be an influential actor wanting to be like Central Asia and Asia Minor and into Europe has benefits for Turkey. Um, so jinxing it is not necessarily on Erdogan's um, priority. So that's going to be a difficult one because that's where the inconsistency starts emerging. So on one hand, I think President Erdogan loves the position of being this bold um, Muslim statesman who's often able to say things which others don't want to say, like on Rabah issue, which, which was very true. There was a massacre of Muslim Brotherhood. You know, that was very true. What he was saying was a military coup in Egypt. Um, and similar to Palestine issues and all the concerns that we share, but then this gross silence on now Uyghur Chinese suffering. But that's quite actually consistent with all the other leaders of the Muslim majority states in the Middle East, and they're totally silent. And in fact, you know, Mohammed bin Salman went even to the extent of praising Chinese efforts to counter terrorism. Forget about keeping quiet about it. So I think there you find the discontinuity of a lot of the Muslim leaders in the Middle East who likes to play that kind of moral stand. But when it comes to China at the moment, because of financial reasons, and I think because of the idea of when elephants are fighting, you you know, you don't want to be the one caught in between. So clearly US and China are gearing towards an escalation of sorts. And maybe some of the countries, including Turkey, are trying to see where do I sit? And I think for the UK, it's always going to be closer to the US. But even for the UK, it's extremely difficult, depending upon which bit of the HMG you ask. The question of China will get a different answer and a different kind of policy proposal because it's a very complex portfolio for Europeans especially. For US, it seems to be a bit more straightforward with a consensus on it. I think for Ankara, it's going to be ducking down and keeping quiet and trying to get basically financial investment, which then will raise serious ethical questions on you know, all the other moments where Ankara decides to raise the suffering of people, but keeps it quiet on the biggest genocide. But I think the UK has a mature relationship with Turkey enough to compartmentalize. And I don't think there's ever been an expectation put on Turkey to join this kind of public statements on the Uyghur genocide and, and what's happening in China. And I think because people in Europe and UK and US appreciate, especially in the UK, the limitations that Turkey has in taking such a stand within this conjuncture. Thank you, Mr. Um, Joe, please. I think you're, you're right about declarations, Zia. I don't think the pressure is great on that, but, um, you know, people are following very closely what's happening to those Uyghurs who are in Turkey. And what happens to them is going to play very heavily in, in, in Western press. And it's not a large number of people, but it's a significant one. And it's one of the things that separates Turkey from some of the other Muslim countries who don't actually have much of an Uyghur population to deal with on their doorstep. So here's a case where um, big gestures to China and being nasty to Uyghur refugees in Turkey would play extremely badly. I hope they, they, people have the sense in Ankara to make sure that that doesn't happen because every bleat, every legitimate complaint from a, a distressed Uyghur woman in, gets big publicity on the Western uh, media. Um, you know, would you like to say anything about that? Well, this is uh, one of the contentious issues between the opposition and the government, of course. Uh, all the opposition parties uh, 
have uh, very, very uh, strict views on uh, what is happening in Xinjiang. And uh, they are, of course, criticizing uh, the approach of the government, uh, which is, uh, as defined by uh, Zia, uh, a kind of a silent mode. Uh, and this is uh, severely being criticized uh, by the Republican People's Party, by the Good Party, and all the opposition parties. Uh, and I think uh, that uh, will probably become an issue if, uh, as Sir John has mentioned, if uh, the uh, uh, extradition of uh, uh, Uyghurs uh, living in Turkey happens, uh, and it will become an issue between uh, uh, many European countries uh, and also between the US and Turkey, uh, if not necessarily uh, between the Council of Europe and Turkey. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Um, I've got a question now, which is specifically addressed to John uh, from Gunay Yildiz, who is a journalist for the BBC News. Um, Gunay says, the UK has been less critical than the EU of Turkish policies in Syria, Libya, Nagorno-Karabakh, and the Eastern Mediterranean. Why and how does the UK divert from the EU position on these issues? Well, you've stumped because I haven't followed it closely enough to really know. I mean, it, it, it's case of priorities, I suppose. Certain subjects are priority matters um, and some aren't. And it just hasn't been a big issue on which the UK wanted to get into a, a, a fight with Turkey. I mean, in a future relationship, there's going to have to be a certain amount of pulling of punches in both directions, I think. Uh, and that's part of the characteristic of a, of a mature relationship. Good foreign policy doesn't constantly involve using a sledgehammer on each other. And I think the UK might be more restrained on some of those subjects and keep them for private debate, private discussion, um, private lobbying um, in relation in particular to Syria, I suppose. But I, I don't have any insight to offer on that legitimate question. Zia, you might uh, want to say something? I mean, I think Sir John instinctively says what I think as well. I mean, some of these issues, which obviously matter a lot, like what happens in Karabakh, what is happening in Libya, but UK has been actually not that engaged in some of these portfolios mm. anyway. Like Libya, for example, we're not really there, even though UK was there to start, right, with the ousting of Qaddafi. That topic kind of fizzled out in London. Nobody wants to talk about Libya. Um, because it's not necessarily at this stage an important issue. A Brexit was a big issue, and redefining UK relations with all these major actors has been a big issue. Trade, com trade conversations have been big. I think Syria has been more directly relevant in the bilateral relationship vis-a-vis -vis what's happening in Northeast Syria. But even there, actually, talking to you know, British officials in defense and security, um, they've been understanding of Turkey's concern. In fact, in terms of the question of PKK, um, UK has done more to accommodate um, Turkish sensitivities on UK, PKK gathering of funds and networks and training political activities in the UK than any other European partner. Even arresting of some of the YPG militants that joined the fight and came back to the UK, they faced courts actually in the UK and, and the legal statements have been quite clear. I mean, you're joining a listed organization, so you can't just anyway. So I think from Ankara's perspective and London's perspective, Syria has been the most contentious thing to handle because London has also not been too keen on Turkish operations in North East Syria or North Syria and basically contentions with the counter ISIS coalition. There has been friction in those moments where actually London actively wanted Turkey not to intervene, not to invade, not to advance and actually find a domestic solution to the Kurdish issue. But understanding of the fact that inevitably Turkey's own security calculus is different and, and they do what they want to do. So there's also a limit to what Britain can achieve or what US can achieve or what we can achieve in some of these policy preferences by Ankara. But I think from kind of UK perspective, um, Cyprus has a what possibility of uh, escalating. I mean, Cyprus has been escalating last year, but I don't think we've seen the end of that crisis at all. Um, and there are a few scenarios where you could see Cyprus emerging again because Europe doesn't want to solve it, really. I mean, there's a lethargy over the question of Cyprus. And when Cyprus issues escalate again, one way or another, with one party doing something, um, and I can see how President Erdogan has actually hinted, saying maybe two-state solution, or you know, it only takes one talk about referendum in northern Cyprus, maybe, 
for northern Cyprus to join Turkey. You know, it, it only takes one press statement like that to trigger a whole another escalation. That would put a lot of tension on UK-Turkey relations to even though we're outside of EU, our sovereign what's uh, happening between Greeks and Turks and Cypriots would need to be protected and UK needs to protect its assets there as well. So I think it will put UK into a difficult position um, to kind of balance its bilateral relationship with Turkey, protect its interest on the island of Cyprus in terms of sovereign territories and bases, and also find a way forward. I think UK still wants to see a unified Cyprus, a bit like the Coffee Annan plan. My view has been Actually, unification of Cyprus has died in 2004 with the Cypriot entry into EU. Since then, it's been a futile exercise. We need to move on to find another framework. Um, at the moment, um, you know, Foreign Secretary is really actually interested in Cyprus and Mediterranean issues, but I'm not seeing necessarily a new approach to push a new direction. But I think Cyprus is likely to be a very near, again, con contention mm -hmm. uh, between UK-Turkey relations. Thank you, Zira. Um, I think it's time we drew these conclusions, this, this discussion to a conclusion. Um, I'm not, of course, going to sum up, but I am going to ask whether any of our panelists would like to make a final comment before we close. I'll hold my peace. No? Okay, well, you've all been terrific. I mean, you've been uh, a, a, a richly rewarding panel, uh, far-sighted, uh, penetrating and all kinds of uh, good things, which I'm sure the audience will have greatly appreciated. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you also to everyone who attended. And could I say to the attendees that it is only through uh, the support and membership of the BIA of people like you attendees that we're able to run these sorts of things. So we, we, we will continue to support this. Thank you all very much indeed. Goodbye. Thank you, David, and thank you all. All the best.